Uh, we're going to talk about expandable T-lift technology. Um, this is something that, uh, again, kind of like SI joint fusions have become a, a bit more popular. So uh, here, are my right button. here are my disclosures. Oh, how did that get on there? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Here are my disclosures. Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry. <sighs> Um, anyways, uh, these are the kind of the three guidelines, three points that I hopefully will touch on. Although the field is actually quite huge, so um, you know some of these uh, will you know probably glance over more than others. So the question is, you know, what's what's the rationale? You know, why why expand? Why are we talking about expandable T lift cages? Is this something new? Um, what's the need? In other words, you know, is it a pain pill? Or is it more like a vitamin? Is it a need to have, or is a must? Is it, is a nice to have? Mark Wahlberg, Dorchester guy, just south of Boston. Um, anyway, so when you're talking about expansion, what does what does that mean? What are you talking about? Something that gets bigger, that you know goes in the disc space. And I think what we're talking about is placing an implant uh, in the disc space. John Krasinski, by the way, Rhode Island. Um, that goes into the disc space and then expands sort of post-placement. Um, and what are we talking about? Well, you can expand in height, you can expand in width, you can expand in sort of lordosis or angulation. Um, so again, what does that mean? Well, I, I think the idea that you're doing it MIS almost is kind of a given, if you ask me. Uh, the whole point is, let, you know, smaller and smaller access. And we saw Dr. Yu's uh, cadaver, um, uh, cadaver demonstration. Again, that was an expandable cage. It only expanded one dimension, but it was still an expandable cage. So it's a little bit basically like building a ship in a bottle. And that's a little bit how I explain it to my patients because, uh, you know, some folks think they really deserve this big incision. If you're getting something really radical like a spinal fusion, then, you know, they should have a big incision. You know, they should really deserve to have that. And uh, you tell them, well, no, we're just, you know, doing a small small incision. We'll, we'll build everything on the inside. And, and it really, you know, some patients will say, well, God, that's, that's really amazing. And say, no, it's just, the, you know, it's just how we do it. Now, if you think about, let's say, doing tube surgery, which, again, you know, uh, Kevin's here. Um, you know, he's been thinking about these things for decades, probably longer than I've, doing, I've been doing spine surgery. But one thing that you think about is that we work essentially through a small aperture, right? And that essentially defines sort of a working cone. Um, and, and that's sort of our cone. And you think about what's at the bottom of the cone, which is where we're working, whether it's foramen, nerve root, um, Kamen's triangle, disc space. Our, our vision, even though we're looking again through a small hole, if you're just looking at the outside, when you're actually looking in and you kind of move your head around, you're actually seeing a much bigger space, which is a much bigger working space. And so the idea of kind of looking at that going, you know, we feel like we're wasting space. And so there's a lot of intuitive feeling that, gee, we can actually do better. We could put something in there that's bigger. Um, and again, you know, if you look at these two, you know, I don't really have a mathematical equation for this, but in case you're wondering, the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared times the height. So if you guys can figure that out, um, I'd appreciate that. But anyways, you're talking about a bigger space. So again, it makes intuitive sense for us as surgeons and, you know, for us, you know, who like to tinker in there, you, again, you look in, you say, geez, I, I could do better. I could put in a bigger cage. Um, and, and we compete, right? We like to compete because people always say, well, you know, the problem with the T-lift cage is too small. And, you know, size matters when, it talk, when we're talking about putting in inner body cages. So, I, you know, T-lift guys have kind of what I call footprint envy, you know, meaning like, you know, you kind of like, oh, look at that, how small that footprint is, you know. I can put in an A-lift with a much bigger footprint. So I think, again, there's that competition to say, well, hey, look, I can do a really minimally invasive, you know, minimal dissection endoscopic operation, you know, saving the multifidus muscles, you know, all this great stuff that we talked about, and then also accomplish some of the things that an ALF accomplishes without doing a large anterior exposure. But what are the challenges, of course? Well, one thing, of course, is neural retraction, neural impaction. You know, when, when I first started doing tube T-lifts, I never really got anxious or worried about any part of the procedure until the cage actually went in. Because as you guys know, when you go to actually put that cage in, the whole field disappears. It becomes a bit of an act of faith. And so you kind of 
stick it in there and you're, you can't see anything. If there's blood, you really can't see anything. So you take your mallet, you cock the thing behind your ear, and you smack the thing as hard as you can, and you just kind of like, you know, look up to the sky and, you know, undo the thing and look in. You hope to God you don't find a nerve root kind of sucked in the disc space. Thankfully, as of yet, that hasn't happened to me, and theoretically, hopefully it never will, but you just never know. So there's, you know, that's the one point of anxiety that I was always, I would always have to deal with. So, you know, if you could get rid of that, even just to save my own, um, you know, blood pressure, I'd be really appreciative, you know. Um, again, the other part is the footprint. Again, you know, the footprint envy that people have or that the, the T-Lift guys have. And again, it's, it's primarily because your window is limited and that's by design, right? It's MIS, minimal invasive, minimal access, whatever you want to call it. You know, we don't want to do the large incision. Um, and again, remember, it's not the size of the incision that matters. It's all about protecting and preserving the soft tissue envelope. Uh, so, you know, do these expandable implants matter? Well, this is very interesting, very simple study looking at, and I believe it was this, um, this implant they examined, but essentially it's, it's a, you know, what happens when you put in a cage with a bigger footprint? Uh, they looked at, again, flexion extension, medial lateral bending, axial rotation, uh, and they found, of course, that the expandable implant did better than a straight, you know, um, you know capstone type sort of, um, um, you know, just sort of a straight implantable cage of whatever variety it was. Uh, the more interesting thing that they did, though, was they looked at their data compared to uh, other uh, ALIF data, but also, um, I believe, uh, T-lift plus uh, various T-lift or bilateral T-lift procedures, and they found that, you know, a single expandable cage works. Makes sense, right? Nobody's surprised. We're glad they did the data. I, you know, I'm glad it makes sense to me. Um, and again, you know, out of uh, VJ's lab, they looked at, uh, again, I believe it's this first implant on the left, laser pointer, man. anyways, the, the implant on the, oops, implant on the far left, they looked at a double T-lift, almost like a plif, um, and then they looked at sort of an anterior placed T-lift cage, and then again, your typical straight, you know, kind of Brannigan type cage. And, and again, they found that the, uh, the, the cage on the left, the Avid cage versus the double T-lift, had similar, yeah, had similar um, characteristics. Doesn't surprise any of us. Again, glad they did it, and it makes tons of sense. So when you're talking about placing a cage, I think the actual location of it also matters. And this is primarily more if we're talking about looking at lordosis or something like that. But if you think about it, okay, you put in a T-lift cage and it goes in straight and your, you know, your disc space goes up and everyone's amazed and you, you know, pat yourself on the back. But if you think about it, you're, you're gonna lose on the lordosis side. Think about where the fulcrum is when you put in a cage in a straight way. Again, typical branding and cage. Um, and more importantly, if you really believe the biomechanics of a motion segment, which is actually more in the posterior two-thirds, um, you know, three-quarters of the uh, end plate, then you're really not going to get any, uh, certainly, change in lordosis, right? So then that's why people have gone to these sort of banana kidney cages where they pound them in the front. Uh, back in the day, we used to put straight cages, turn them, and take a foot of tamp and just smash them as far to the front as we could, um, some with not-so-great consequences. I've got some terrible x-rays that... Thank God, you know, this is before digitization. I think I melted them in a fireplace somewhere. Um, but again, if you look at an anterior place cage, if you really want to, if you're going for a low dosis, you can actually angulate this and actually move this back and, and actually get, you know, some angulation there. So again, cage placement actually does matter. Um, this study out of West Virginia where they did exactly that, you can see the two different cage um, placements. Uh, I believe they're... You know, they might be from the same company, it doesn't really matter. But again, if you place the cage anteriorly, you can actually use it as a fulcrum. And the chart on the right essentially shows that. Um, and T1, 2, and 3, I believe, is at uh, post-op one month and uh, one month, three months, and six months post-op. And again, you find about five degrees segmental change in segmental lordosis. Um, what is the value of disk space expansion? You know, I used to have this chemistry professor, Mr. Mr. Frank Cardula, I'll never forget the guy, terrified of him. But he always used to say, well, so what? You know, he said, never, never be afraid to ask the question, so what? Not in a rude or kind of a, you know, brusque way, but think to yourself, well, so what? You know, when we're doing, when we're writing papers, we're doing research, and you ask this question, and you say, oh, geez, I'm doing this research project. You always have to ask yourself, so what? What's the application of doing this work? 
you know, so so what? What's the this, what's the value of you know getting a taller disk space? Well, certainly indirect decompression is very valuable, and certainly you know we heard a lot about the lateral experience, and that's one of the really great you know I think great sort of technical outcomes that occur from that operation. You get great central canal, but you really do get great foraminal decompression. You can reduce a spondylolisthesis, um, and you can get really good anatomical alignment. Here's a classic example. A uh, lady, she's a um, nurse, she's a diabetologist, actually. Um, and you know, she came in with this you know, single-sided leg pain. Uh, and obviously, you can see there's a pretty significant difference in terms of uh, her foramen. So I don't know if that shows up well, but uh, you can see the cage that we put in, and you can see that single metal dot. There's another one behind it. You're not seeing it very well. But again, you know, we also want to reduce the spondylolysis. So you know, we put in some pedicle screws. And in fact, I think, Jeff, you kind of showed something very similar to this, where you can actually take this and you can essentially reduce that so that you significantly um, expand that frame in there. So there's, there is value to having increased cage height. So the question is, we can do it width, we can do it in height, and again, there are devices that do it in lordosis. And so the question is, you know, you have to actually change the shape of the device once you get in there because you can't obviously put in a wedge-shaped device um, uh, from the back. So there are a plethora now in the same way I think you know when Ralph just showed all these SI joint implants there are lots and lots and lots of devices out there that can do this. So uh, again height is the most common one we have you know width expandable ones. Um, the height, again, is height restoration, but also lordosis. Um, the uh, lordosis, uh, the lord lordosing implants, again, typically have to, there has to be some kind of compromise in its structure uh, in order to essentially get that to rock back. Uh, and again, this is where placement really, really matters. It's very, very critical how these implants are placed. Uh, and again, the width expandable ones. The, this one on the bottom, that the lock and rail system is actually assembled in sort of at one site and kind of pushed across um, uh, BTI, I believe. So there is a device, Luna, um, out there. In fact, they're here. And, uh, and in full disclosure, outside of my dislike for Richard Sherman, <coughs> is that I'm not a consultant for the company. Um, but I have, he's all right. He's a good player. I mean, you know, I like Patrick Peterson a little better, but. Anyways, we won't get into that. Um, the, uh, the device actually goes in uh, on a rail. It goes in as a circle. Uh, the, to me, the, the cardinal characteristics of it is that it gives you a very large footprint, as you can see on the image in the middle. Um, so you get both that medial lateral expansion, but there's a third rail. Anybody from Chicago? The L, the third rail, okay, never mind. Um, anyways, there would always be like one or two homeless person who would die here because they would urinate on the third rail and they would electrocute themselves. So there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of third rail jokes I like to make. Um, but anyway, so, uh, but I digress. Uh, and the other thing that it does, it, once it goes inside to you, you can see that middle, middle wire there. That actually isn't there when the implant goes in. As you drive that middle wire through, that will actually increase in height as well. And then coming down the pike, actually released already, is an implant where, in fact, you would imagine as those two rail, if those two rails are parallel, you get symmetric height uh, increase. But now those two rails, again, the top and bottom rail, are actually asymmetrically wedge-shaped. So as you expand in the middle, you also get height and lordosis. Um, how, how do we get into trouble? Well, some of these devices are cute. I think they're technologically advanced. Um, and they sort of range in the, the, they sort of expand the gamut. I think this is a device, I believe it's, I think it's called Stax. I'm not familiar with it, but it's a device that I believe you, it goes in and then you slide little wafers down into it and it, I guess, stacks. <laughs> it's clever. Uh, it stacks. This is an immediate post op film on the left. And these guys had this really great case report about this. Now, what happened was that one of these wafers had dislodged a year after surgery. The problem wasn't the device. I don't think it's because the patient actually got a non-union. But what I do think happened was that, you know, as this thing expands, the footprint obviously doesn't change. So if you think about it, it's like a stack of books, right? Now, these wafers are supposed to lock, but if you think about it, I mean, obviously a, a stack of books that are only two or three books tall, 
not that unstable, but as you put six or seven books on top, that top book really starts to get pretty, pretty creaky. And again, because the footprint doesn't change, height expansion has to be has to be managed. I think we all certainly early on in my practice, I was always really proud of myself. I can get this massively tall cage in, and I somehow thought I was accomplishing something great. Um, I don't think that's what we need to be after. I don't think you know more is better when it comes, especially when it comes to disc space height. Um, because I think all you're doing is potentially creating an unstable situation. They use bilateral pedicle screws in this case, by the way, as you can see. So again, I think disc height really needs to be watched and managed carefully. So again, just kind of starting to wrap up. Um, if you look at T lift versus A lift, you know, again, there are pluses and minuses on either side. Uh, again, cage, of course, again, it's a, it is a smaller footprint. But you know, if you think about it, the approach is very simple, it's very familiar, it's very benign to the patient. Um, yeah, ALIF is great. You can put this massive cage in, you can do this great annulotomy, but you know what? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure if, I'd, uh, if I had to you know, debate between having a big incision on my abdomen, deal with all the issues of ileus, potential ventral hernias and all that, I don't know. I think that would be, it'd be a tough debate for me as well. Um, and this is a really interesting study out of South Korea where they looked at uh, several hundreds of uh, T-lifts looking at cage subsidence. And basically what they found is that, you know, at three, four, four, five, used bilateral pedicle screws, you rarely get subsidence. A lot of it happens at 5.1. Um, and they think it's largely because of the lordosis. So you've got a height problem and a lordosis problem here that we haven't quite solved yet with uh, static cages. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, expandable posterior sort of technologies uh, have a distinct and I think an important role, particularly in interbody fusion as we progress forward. Um, I, you know, I bug one of my partners because he, he, he trained at Jefferson and he calls the T-lift the Todd lift after uh, Todd Albert, but he just, he just loves the T-lift operation. And he went through this, this long spat of doing a lot of T-lift revisions. And he couldn't figure out why you know, he was getting so many non-unions. So then he switched to doing A-lifts. And you know, he, you know, we were kind of talking about it. And, and he just said, you know, I just, I don't know. I just think there's something about the discectomy. So I think there's more to it. And I think by, by us focusing on expandable technologies, particularly medial lateral technologies, uh, I think that will also get us into the mode of doing better discectomies from the back, which is also very important. Um, the techniques are involving, evolving, as are the technologies, and, and those do go hand in hand. But uh, again, those are, you know, those are happening at the same time. Um, I think, you know, what's, what's the phrase? If there are 100 ways to do something, that means there's not one right way to do it. Uh, I think we're getting there. I, it, I think the, the industry is probably going to come back around. I think there will be certain winners that will start to float to the top. And again, don't forget, despite the fact that you can put in a bigger cage from the back, doesn't mean you can still do a bad discectomy. Doesn't mean you don't have to put biologic or a good biologic or a lot of biologic in. Thank you very much.